Hi, I'm Jonathan Downey, the founder and CEO of Airware. And today we have with us Eric Cheng, who's the director of aerial imaging at DJI. DJI, of course, is famous for their Phantom quadcopters, which have been used around the world to capture stunning aerial photography by both hobbyists as well as professional photographers alike. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me. DJI and Airware, of course, both companies in the drone space, but with a little bit different focus. At Airware, we're building the electronics, software, and cloud services so that other companies can build drones, um, many focusing on enterprise applications of data collection. And at DJI? Yeah, and at DJI, we are focused on, uh, on producing full imaging solutions for people to be creative, basically unlock creativity and to uh, allow them to sort of do the things that they only dreamed about doing. And for people who don't know, you're also the editor and publisher of wetpixel.com, mm -hmm. a website dedicated to underwater photography. And you're also involved in shark conservation. So when did your um, passion for photography take you underwater? Uh, it was sort of an accident. Um, I was working as a software engineer and uh, sort of, I was in enterprise software and I, and I didn't actually care what the company did. You know, I was very interested in solving problems and being surrounded by really smart people, which is you know, what happens in Silicon Valley and tech. And uh, at the same time, I was really interested in the ocean through kind of you know, maintaining saltwater aquariums and uh, sort of very separate things. Um, and I was a diver, sort of a hobbyist diver and a hobbyist photographer. But when I took a camera underwater for the first time, all of that sort of became one. You know, suddenly I had the inspiration for what would take me beyond technical imagery, you know, just the ability to shoot a sharp picture that, uh, you know, was well exposed, uh, which is, you know, where a lot of people end up when they don't have inspiration. And so it was really the ocean world and um, the ability to see something and to document something new. You know, e even now when everything, pretty much everything has been explored, you know, you can go into the ocean, see something that no one has seen and capture it. And so that is really a driving force um, in, and, and it was what made me into a photographer. I've seen some of your underwater photography. There, it's amazing. Is there one image that you're particularly proud of underwater and maybe a story behind it? There are actually two. Um, and the reason I separate them is because there's the image that is the most popular, which is mm -hmm. a picture of a screaming turtle. You know, it's, he's got his I've seen hands up there. Um, and pe in fact, people send me pictures of this image tattooed on other people. They just <laughs> find pictures of this image as a tattoo and mail them to me. Um, but that's, be that's been a really popular image and it was hanging up. Uh, it's in, very unique. Yeah, it's unusual. I have been un, un, unable to reproduce it. Uh, I've tried <laughs> with better cameras. The image I think I like the most is an unusual one. It's a picture of a of very common coral, soft coral, uh, with a little goby sitting on it. And it looks like a forest scene. Mm. Uh, and the reason I like it is, is because people actually do think it's taken on land when they see it. And then they realize... It's very it's, hard to tell it's underwater. Yeah, and they realize that they don't recognize any of the elements in the picture. Um, and the reason I like it is because it's, um, it's an unusual view of a relatively common subject that you see when you're diving. And it was accomplished using a really special lens, which is a long relay lens which is with a fisheye element at the end. So if you imagine a fisheye lens one inch in diameter and a very long relay, bunch of relay uh, optics to a camera, you can insert that lens underneath coral canopies and, and, and you know, sort of look at the world from the point of view of a, of a very small animal. So that's why it looks like that. It's actually, those corals are this tall, but they look like giant trees. Um, <laughs> and uh, all pictures taken with the setup, which is a very challenging one to use, uh, have that kind of fantastic look. You've of course taken your career now to the air and are well known for a lot of your aerial photography. Tell me a little bit about that transition. The transition was, was pretty natural. Um, I found myself in amazing situations all the time. You know, you'd be on the ocean and, and it was just look out over the water from a boat in the middle of nowhere and realize that it's just untouched and sort of, you know, the most beautiful thing. Um, but there's no way to see it, <laughs> you know. The highest I could get was by climbing masts of boats you know, to photograph the environment. Um, and so we would be drawing pictures of what the reef looked like underwater, but really all you would have to do is get above it and shoot down and you'd be able to see these structures. I'd always dreamed that I would be able to take pictures fr from any perspective and sort of set the scene. We often talk about drones as tools. How have these been tools for photographers and storytellers? When these first came on the scene a couple of years ago, when the ready to fly ones did, um, people were so enamored by the drone itself that they forgot that the they were- The flying robot. The flying robot, yeah. They were so interesting that they forgot that they're just tools to accomplish something. 
And for photographers, it's really um, unbounded placement in the third dimension, placement and movement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that includes both getting a device there with, that's able to capture something that, you know, could be beautiful, um, but also the movements involved, you know. So all of the tools required to control it in a, in a way that results in something that is not artificial, you know, that doesn't look artificial. Of course, it very much is the way we accomplish it. The goals are not about the technology for creatives. It's about what they allow you to do. The result. The results, yeah. Could you tell us about some of your favorite aerial imagery and maybe some of the stories behind those? Um, my favorite image or set of images actually comes from a trip to Iceland that I did in, in September. I went to uh, fly drones into the volcano that's erupting right now wow. in the middle, middle of Iceland. Um, and so the, these were, this is really was an attempt to get the first like, fish-eye, super wide-angle shots of an erupting volcano from very close range. You know, there are, of course, helicopters you can go up and shoot with a long lens. Maybe some people might hike up to the lip of a caldera, but no one's going to go anywhere near an, a, a volcano that's actually erupting. I've seen this photo. It's very unique. Yeah, it's really unusual because the volcano, the, the magma that's coming up is actually above where the drone is. It's a giant eruption. Um, and, you know, we shot it oh, from relative safety, you know, safety unless it actually blew. <laughs> right. Um, and these kinds of shots are just so unusual. They haven't existed in history and we're able to capture them for the first time. DJI is a Chinese company. I, I'm curious, is the, is the Phantom as popular in China as it is in the U.S.? Well, the U.S. is certainly the, the largest market for DJI, um, and Europe is also very large. But it's, it's also very popular in China, and of, and of course, because it's, DJI is a Chinese company, um, it's, it's very well known in media. So we're seeing a lot of traction as more and more people are able to afford something like the Phantom in China, so it's becoming a, a definitely a major market. DJI has often been called the GoPro of drones, and now GoPro is um, entering the drone market. How does DJI think about differentiating themselves? So th I think that's a really interesting question because as GoPro starts to move into our market and, and camera manufacturers in general, um, the question really is how are they going to differentiate themselves mm. from what we do? Um, I, I think the question now has been flipped because you know, we are making cameras as well. Um, we haven't made a standalone camera yet, but we have announced handheld gimbals for small cameras. Okay. Uh, like the Inspire gimbal now can be removed and put on a stick, you know, which powers it and lets, you, uh, lets the camera talk to things like smartphones. That's not coming out for another few months. But I think you know, for a camera company to move into the drones market um, requires a lot, of, a lot more engineering. It just shows that the interest in this area is, is so great that a lot of companies are, are now moving uh, into the market from cameras and, and vice versa like we did. What are some of the biggest technical challenges that still have yet to be overcome um, to enable cinematography and aerial photography at an even greater scale? I think that the technical challenges are probably very similar to the challenges that um, Airware is facing or, or other com companies. Pretty much any drone company, regardless of the industry, is dealing with things like sense and avoid, um, battery technology, you know, 15 minutes is fine to shoot one scene, but you know, if mm -hmm. you need to opportunistically capture a shot from something that lasts an hour, uh, you're sort of out of luck. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I think you know, we we as as well as everyone else <laughs> are working on on those two things in particular, um, and also uh, perhaps t uh, better tools at capture time. You know, right now we're seeing a lot of that happen in industry in the form of survey and autonomy and survey and things like that. Um, in cinematography, we haven't seen a lot of that. And um, at CES, there are a whole bunch of companies that were showing off features like, you know, auto selfie or, you know, auto whatever. You know, these, these tools that could help a cinematographer if they weren't competent pilots to achieve certain kinds of shots. So I think, you know, the combination of those sorts of automated or assisted tools with sense and avoid and longer battery life will kind of strike that perfect balance, you know, between creative control from an operator and auto enough autonomy to help them do it successfully. Prior to being at DJI, you worked at Lytro, a company building a camera that actually allows the user to focus the picture after the picture is taken. Has anyone used those cameras on drones? So those were light field cameras, or planoptic cameras. And um, uh, as far as I know, I'm the only one who's done it. I mean, before I joined DJI and I was still experimenting in, this, in the aerial space, um, I put Lytro cameras with special firmware on 
on quadcopters and use them. And what um, are some of the results? Well, you know, they were refocusable shots. Yeah. But because I didn't, we didn't have good st stabilization then. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't have access to it, um, and so. Uh, it's very hard to frame a shot that's zoomed in a lot. And you know, light, what Lightfield is really good at is giving you tremendous depth of field or the ability to refocus without having to actually focus the camera at capture time. So um, it's really great for a system that, that needs to shoot at a long zoom, um, but perhaps might not be able to achieve focus. So you know, basically, if you're shooting wide angle, it may not be so useful because probably everything's in focus. <laughs> So I think it could be really interesting for a longer term application. You know, once we figure out how to do optical zoom in a small package, then suddenly light field becomes interesting. As access to these small drones becomes easier and easier, of course, um, safety becomes an increasing concern. What are some of the things that you think regulators can be doing to enable greater levels of safety? One of the things that surprised me when I, you know, when I went to visit DC last time um, was how little direct experience regulators had with, with the products in question. So, you know, people will go up on the stand with a Phantom and talk about it, but no one's flown one there. <laughs> you know, so I, maybe because they, they can't fly them or don't know where to fly them or have to fly them for hobby, you know, specifically. Yeah. Um, it's surprising. It's surprising. So I, I would expect regulators to be in the field every weekend learning about all of the, the, the products that we all are trying to regulate. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when, when I go in with a Phantom, is, we should all be speaking a common language already. We're not speaking that common language right now. So I would say that, you know, we as a company and, and those of us in the industry, I think, have all been willing to take part in these conversations. And I, I know Airware is tremendously involved and, mm -hmm. and we're in a coalition together doing this. Yep. But I think the conversation is just starting. So, you know, these are, these are things that, um, that we all need to become more involved in. What's one of the upcoming things coming out for photographers and cinematographers? One of the things that I'm excited about in, in our line are having the quality of cameras kind of start to approach the quality of handheld cameras. Okay. Um, you know, in we, small form factors. In small form factors. You know, so, so GoPro really pushed this early on. You know, they had video cameras that could shoot at a, at a very high quality for their size. And, um, I think in, the, in aerial platforms, people right now are still compromising. You know, you either have to fly a very, like a heavy lift aircraft with a red camera, uh, or you fly a small thing that has a camera that might not do exactly what you want. And then one thing I mentioned before were, you know, sort of autonomous assist features. You know, when you're flying, um, if you need to have your, your, uh, your camera pointed at something, but you want to fly and focus just on the flying, that should be something that should just work. And so these sorts of autonomous um, sort of assisted operation modes, I think are going to start playing a real role in how we capture from the air. So you, you use these systems a lot to continue to capture some amazing aerial photography. Is there a destination that you have in mind that you haven't been to yet? I can't get enough of Iceland. You know, I went there twice last year, once on vacation with my wife and once for this volcano shoot. The landscapes there are fantastic. They look Alien. In fact, Prometheus was a lot of Prometheus was right. filmed there. You know, you can actually take a normal picture there, and it will look like an alien world. You know, so that's a place I'd love to explore more. Very exciting. I hope you get to uh, get out get out there a little bit more to Iceland. Thank you, Eric Chang, director of aerial imaging at DJI. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it.